church. That word may bring to mind the chapel where you hear the pastor preach, the school gym where you attended youth group, the place you go on Sundays, maybe even a service you watch online. Church is all these things, but so much more. It's not simply a building. It's a body. The body of Christ made up of diverse members who share a single faith. We all struggle, but we all believe. We all go through trials, but we have hope that Christ will return to His body, His bride, His people. There are many buildings where believers meet, but one true church where we affirm our faith in the one true God who calls those from every nation, tribe, people, and language to join His family. He calls us to meet together. We come together to acknowledge God's presence and power in our lives, confess our sins, receive mercy, hear the word proclaimed, sing praise, pray for peace, remember Christ's sacrifice, bear one another's burdens, and welcome all to this place of grace. Amidst loneliness and isolation, the church is a beacon of hope, a reminder of our need for God and for each other. When we take time each week to worship, we join ourselves to believers throughout the world and throughout the ages, to all who are members of Christ's body, the church. Have you ever been in a spooky place, a place that made your hair stand up on the back of your neck? An uneasy locale? We'll talk about that today. Pastor Mark Hinsley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs. I want to welcome you as you're watching. Let us know where you're watching from, how we can pray for you, and then share this with your friends. That way we partner together in declaring the wonderful works of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that when we find ourselves in a difficult, tight place, you are there. Thank you that your promise is never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Remind us of that when sometimes we're hard-pressed to remember your promises. Help us to stay fixed and focused on the hope we have in the risen Christ. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness to come. And Holy Spirit, thank you for indwelling us as a down payment of that future eternal life with our Lord. Face to face, we shall behold him. Until that day, find us hopeful and trusting in the rough places and the scary places. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we've all been in a place like that in the journey of our life, a physical, uh, difficult, frightening condition, place, experience. Years ago, Laura and I, I had a wonderful vacation. We drove uh, from San Francisco to Seattle with no agenda, so wherever the day took us, but about the time we got uh, into Oregon, driving on that Oregon coast, and those tall, towering trees were crowding in. It was dark, and Laura was asleep, and I just knew a Bigfoot was going to step out of those trees at any moment. And he never made his appearance, but it didn't keep me from wandering all the way up the Oregon coast. Well, sometimes we find ourselves in a difficult place emotionally or maybe on the receiving end of some unkindness or abuse. And it's important to realize that it's in the frightening and scary and murky places of our journey that the Lord is there. There's nowhere where we escape his nearness and his presence. I'm so glad for that. You can count on him when things are uh, obtuse or obscure or frightening. He is the God who is always near and always with us. Aren't you glad for that. Sometimes things cause us perplexity. We wonder about the current experience I'm, I'm facing. And sometimes we find ourselves wanting to exit quickly. And exit and quickly never seem to belong in the same sentence when we're going through a particular trial of some kind. 
I think of the Apostle Paul when I think about the times in our life when we want desperately the experience we're having to be a past experience. Paul, as you know, in our continued series through the book of 2 Timothy is in a rough, frightening place in Rome, a city of a million people. He is in the Mamertine prison as he writes the last book he will write on this earth, the book of 2 Timothy, writing to a young man who was about 40 who needed to be encouraged because he had a difficult road to hoe himself as he pastored a church in the city of Ephesus. So Paul has something to speak into our lives in the scary, eerie, painful, abusive confinement, be it literal or emotional, that we all face at times, and we need God's perspective today. And that hope, that perspective is given by the Apostle Paul so that the now experience is not going to taint your hope or your faith, because before you know it, it will be past tense. The title of the message today is No One Like Jesus, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 13. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. For if we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. No one like Jesus. So true. And it reminds us that there is someone to have in the forefront of our minds through our journey on this planet, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. There is someone to remember. There is also a place to anticipate. I look forward to that. The now that you're experiencing won't always be this way. And then you'll see today that the person you will be is extraordinary. The Bible says we will be like him. Isn't that exciting to think about that? God's plans for you are out of this world. So notice, first of all, under that title, no one like Jesus, there's someone, Paul says, to Timothy to remember. Now, in that part of the passage, notice what Paul says to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains, as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Paul says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Now, Timothy wasn't going to forget who Jesus was. But Paul is making a very important point. In the journey of our life, there's lots of things that will try to distract you from finding your hope and resolve and strength and sustenance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep him foremost in your mind. Remember what he endured. He came into his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. Remember how he was rejected. If you've ever felt an ounce of rejection, the Lord Jesus Christ has felt a ton of it. In fact, someone once said this, if virtue walked the earth, the world would bow down and worship it. And they rightly retorted, virtue walked the earth 2,000 years ago, and they crucified him. Paul is saying, Timothy, the way you'll make it through a long and difficult pastorate in the city of Ephesus, a city of a quarter of a million people brimming with, with trade and with temple worship and idolatry and sexual promiscuity, if you're going to survive through that difficult journey, keep the Lord Jesus Christ, foremost in your mind. Meditate, learn to meditate and think on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that he is risen. I loved how someone put it, the great credential of authenticity was Jesus' resurrection on his life. Paul is saying, I'm bound with chains in this dungeon existence. And remember this, folks, anytime... A follower of Jesus Christ lives completely for him. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face ridicule. 
Paul will later say, earlier I should say, say to Timothy, everyone who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The promise here is even though I am chained, the gospel, God's good news, is not changed. Now, I, I, chained. I like what uh, a wonderful uh, theologian, Carl F.H. Henry, once said about the gospel, which we know means good news. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. And the gospel applied to a sin-soaked heart, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ showing himself to us through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, high and lifted up, can absolutely transform a, a human life. Any man, any woman who is in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what, what Paul is very uh, definite about and intentional about in 2 Timothy, that is his last will and testament for all uh, understanding and purposes. He's saying, don't forget, Timothy, that when things get rough, look up, lift up your eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. That's what it says in Psalms 121. We need to keep our eyes focused, focus, focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and in God's word and realizing the power of his word. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. Aren't you glad for that? I picture Timothy reading this letter, tears moistening his eyes, thinking of how he'll be able to stay faithful in Ephesus when the pressure is on. He needs further to be reminded about what Jesus endured. I think of something Amy Carmichael, a prolific missionary who lived here on earth from 1867 to 1951, once wrote, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. That's the way through the rigors and reversals of life, focused intentionally on the Lord Jesus, someone to remember, someone to focus on in your own journey. Conduct your life, Timothy, he's saying to him, by the commandments and expectations of God's word. And you will be thought of as, as someone who understands what value there is in God's word. And God's word can help you to be wise and know what God wants. Now, if you do that in this world, you will be thought of as out of step, and uh, antiquated and uh, needing to be pushed away into the Smithsonian somewhere. But when cornered and harassed for having a resilient faith in the risen Christ, I challenge you to embrace it, to realize that all who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Each step of your faith journey, recall and remember the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him. Paul is remember, remembering what he's going through. He, he counted imprisonment as a privilege to follow Jesus to an unjust, unjust death of his own. He could celebrate the irony of Nero's injustice. Charles Swindoll said the demented emperor killed Christians, but the message only spread further and further and further. God's word enjoyed even greater freedom. And as someone well said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed bed of the church. Out of the most impossible situations and harrowing experiences, purpose can come and God can deliver us. He is able to deliver me. And he's done that for you and for me. And that's the focus we need to have as we think of someone to remember. Notice in the text, there's a place to anticipate Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, when Paul references the elect here, it's not primarily a reference to predestination. It's really a reference to predetermination to be fixated on the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And focus on him. Be intentional in your thoughts about the Lord. Maximize your, your moments on this earth by focusing on the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and spend a lot of time 
in his word. This is really a call to perseverance, to staying with it, to not giving up. Years ago, Peter Marshall, the great uh, Scottish pastor, was preaching at the Gettysburg Theological Seminary in Georgia, now a, a closed seminary as far as I know. But he was talking to a lot of young young ministers. Someone wants to find a young minister as an embryonic young theologue. And he said this to them, gentlemen, when you feel like resigning, don't. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Press on towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep your anticipated future joyful life with the Lord in the forefront of your mind. Paul is using this reminder to state that we can endure everything, and so could he for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'm so thankful for that. We are and we will obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Glory, you are on your way. He's telling Timothy, and he's telling us too, that as followers of Christ, we must take upon ourselves the name of Jesus, call ourselves his disciples, make him the priority of our life, be willing to endure, be willing to live with a predetermination that we will not quit when the going gets rough. We won't give up. We will not give up in the light of the salvation we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Press on. Don't quit. Watch what God will do. Sometimes just staying with it is is really the key to success. 80% of success, someone said, is just showing up. We've seen that, haven't we, with the post-COVID world? Things we took for granted pre-COVID, like really good service at a restaurant or or cleanliness at a restaurant, or plenty of help at a restaurant. For that matter, plenty of food at a restaurant. Some of that has really changed. It's just different. Sometimes I feel like we're uh, kind of in a Twilight Zone episode. But what do we do when those things happen? We fix our eyes, pin our eyes, rivet our eyes to our Savior. We focus on Him. He will give you perspective. And then we remember the great heroes of the faith, like Paul, what a stalwart, who is in this prison, and yet he's free. The gospel is not bound. It is free. And it is freeing no matter the confines of our current experience. There's such hope in that throughout the text, just to be predetermined to press on. Don't languish in despair. Your answer to prayer could be just a moment away. Some years ago, man wrote a brilliant apologetist by the name of Dr. William Lane Craig a question about heaven. And he was frustrated with his own pastor and other Christians who seemed to be really kind of scant in their ideas or uh, depth when it came to talking about some of the questions. And Bob quite honestly wanted to know, what will I be like? Well, Will I be the same Bob I am now? Will I be able to play golf? Will I be able to to eat pizza? Will I be able to do the things that seem to mean a lot to Bob? Here's how William Lane Craig, brilliant defender of the gospel, responded. He said, Bob, it may be that the reason your Sunday school teachers and pastor have been reluctant to discuss, discuss the questions that you've asked is we know so little about the afterlife that maybe such speculation is fruitless. Better to just wait and see. That being said, I do think we can say with confidence that the heavenly Bob will most certainly not be the same earthly Bob. Oh, to be sure, you'll be the same person, but that person will undergo a vast change. He goes on to say, for the earthly Bob is riddled with sin, plagued with weakness, faltering and failing in his best efforts to live a life for the glory of God. But the heavenly Bob will be set free from sin, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and fully pleasing to God in all that he desires and all that he does. The fact that evil will be banished, Dr. Craig said, from the new heavens and the new earth requires a transformation to our character that we can scarcely 
imagine. And that's so much to look forward to, isn't it? We're talking about someone to remember. We're talking about a place to anticipate. And do you notice finally the person you will be? By the way, this section of scripture is an early Christian hymn. The saying is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we would deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. To live with him at last, to depart, to be with Christ, where Paul will say is better by far. Amazingly, to be in a perfected state with him and all the redeemed of the ages. And the Bible says we will rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. It's amazing things to look forward to. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Here is a promise to all those who endure. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus one day. Timothy, if you can hang in there, if you can keep your eyes fixed on the author and finisher of your faith, if when you're pressed in Ephesus by the pagans and the temple prostitutes and the pressure to, to succumb to a society gone awry, awry, if you can press on, Timothy, and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, have him foremost in your eyes and in your mind and in your thoughts, you're going to make it one step at a time. And the life to come is going to be extraordinary irrespective of the pain, the problems, and the persecution you're now facing, Timothy, he's saying to him, someday you will reign with Jesus in heaven. And it's going to be marvelous. It really will be. William Lane Craig concluded his thoughts with Bob this way. And by the way, Bob was quite enamored with the idea of playing golf, eating, etc. Here's what Craig said to him. He said, it seems to me that my greatest reservation about such earthly pursuits continuing is that it seems to me that the adulterated vision of Christ now no longer seen in a poor mirror, but face to face will be overwhelming and all consuming that no one would want to play golf rather than singing his praises and worshiping him. If that sounds boring to you, Bob, <laughs> then you have not yet grasped the incommensurable proof of knowing God and what it's going to be like and the good that it is. So I'm inclined to think, Bob, that people who think that when they get to heaven they'll spend endless time partying or playing golf or painting will be surprised about how their desires have changed once they've been freed from sin and have an unadulterated view of God. It's going to be much better than you ever imagined. The Bible says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Think about it. No one like Jesus. He is someone to think about all the time. No one like Jesus because he's preparing a place for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that where I am there ye may be also. And the person you will be is not the person you are now. You will be transformed by the power of Christ and you will be like him. You will be transformed. And that's so exciting to me. You know, years ago, I, I used to sing a song more often than now by Stephen Curtis Chapman. And it's based on a verse in the book of Philippians that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ Jesus. The essence of the song is that the Lord knows where you are and he is preparing and shaping and mentoring you to become more like him. And one day you will be like him. You will be with him and I will too. And this little song, I pray, encourages you. If you find yourself today in a scary place, a frightening place, maybe emotional, maybe physical, maybe financial or some other way, listen to this song. He who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it 
will be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. If the trouble you're facing is slowly replacing your hope with despair, or the process is long and you're losing your song in the night, you can be sure that the Lord has his hand on you, faithful and true. He will never abandon you. You are his treasure, and he finds his pleasure in you. Sing it with me while you're watching. He who began a good work in you. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, will be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. Because there's no one like Jesus. Father, thank you for your truth to our hearts today. For someone who this day is in an unwelcomed place, I pray that you would guide them out and through it to a better day, that they would look to you and you alone for deliverance and for hope, for counsel and friendship and provision. And I pray that as they fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, their fears and doubt and maybe depression would subside and they would feel the strength and the comfort of God. And if there's someone watching who's not saved, I pray they would sincerely ask you to forgive them of their sin, to come into their life, to be their Savior and Lord. And God, draw them to you today. Draw us to you. And when we're scared, help us to look up to you through the challenges. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. No one like Jesus. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church, hoping and praying that you will fix your eyes on him every step of the rest of your life. Have a good afternoon, folks.